Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Peter Nguyen. I'm a research scientist at the Wies Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering. Uh, it's a bioengineering institute at Harvard University. Um, and today we're going to talk about our uh, recent work where we developed a face mask that can detect uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Nguyen, for that introduction. So as a sort of overarching question before we dive into the specifics of your research, what are synthetic circuits and how do they relate to your work? Sure. So uh, when we say synthetic circuits in our field, what we're referring to are genetic circuits. Um, so these are, you know, what people would normally think of as uh, the think of a living cell. Right. And inside the cell, there's a lot of things going on. The cell is kind of uh, probing its environment. It's uh, adjusting its metabolism. It's, um, it, it's, it's sensing and responding to a lot of things. And all of those things are encoded by the DNA. People know that already. Um, but what we've done in synthetic biology, that's the field that I'm in, is we've taken those genetic circuits that are encoded in DNA, and we can take them apart and make them modular and then rearrange them to make genetic circuits that do something else that we want. Um, and in that way, there we call them genetic synthetic circuits or synthetic uh, artificial genetic circuits, uh, wh whatever you want to say. So here, when we refer to synthetic circuits, what we mean are these artificial genetic constructs um, where we've taken parts from different organisms and pieced them together to make uh, some kind of genetic circuit that performs a function. Um, that is uh, one genetically encoded and two uh, gives us some desired output that we want. Uh, so could you ex uh, expand a bit more on what you mean by modular? So by modular, what we mean is that you can um, take one part from an organism that does a certain thing. And what we can do is we can port that over into a synthetic circuit so that it works uh pretty much every time you want to use that part, it works the same way. So for example, let's say I took a gene from a jellyfish and that gene makes a fluorescent protein. Um, so what I can do is I could take that gene, I could plug it to, into any synthetic circuit. I had to plug it in in the right way, of course, um, just like you would plug in a resistor to a, a normal electronic circuit, right? But in any circuit that I put it into, it would also produce that fluorescent protein uh, the same way. So in that way, we call it modular and that you can you can kind of uh, put that into any circuit you want. So before your research, um, why were these synthetic circuits difficult to place in wearable materials? Yeah, so for the vast majority of the synthetic biology uh, history, the history of synthetic biology, um, all these synthetic circuits, you know, we, we kind of piece them together from parts of, of cells and everything, but they are always usually put back into cells to actually run the circuit. Right. So you can think of these cells again, these, these circuits are synthetic genetically encoded circuits. So they're DNA encoded and we have to put the DNA back into the cell and run it to actually see if the circuit works. So in that case, the, 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 the synthetic circuit is a program and you can think of the, a living cell as like the chassis um, that actually runs that program or the computer that runs that program. And so for execution of these synthetic circuits, you typically always needed a living cell. And so that has been the limit in making wearables uh, wearable devices, wearable materials that contain these uh, artificial genetic circuits. So if you need a living cell, you would need to actually put uh, basically recombinant DNA and genetically engineered cells into a wearable um, and basically wear that around. And so that is the difficulty there. Um, people have done this uh, it, in the laboratory. Um, just to see what it would be like. But having genetically engineered organisms that you wear kind of poses a health hazard, as well as if it ruptures, then you have genetically engineered organisms escaping into the environment, which is something that we do not want. 
And so the requirement um, in the past that we need living organisms, living cells to run these synthetic circuits has been the, the hurdle. So what factors enabled your synthetic circuit, uh, circuit to um, function as a wearable? Yeah, so um, there is uh, a field of research called cell-free uh, uh, called cell-free research, basically. Um, and so in cell-free systems, what you have is you have the ability to lice open a cell. So you, you, you have a bunch of cells. Imagine that you burst them all open, right? And so the cells are no longer alive. We, we've just basically destroyed them. But what you can do is you can take the, the innards of the cells you could take, you could kind of extract all of what's inside of the cell. And now what you have is you have a mixture of all of the machinery that was inside of the cell. Um, all the, the, the little proteins, the ribosomes, the, the transcription factors, all of these things that make the cell uh, function, essentially. And you can use that extract in a limited way. You can actually put these synthetic circuits into this extract. And that, that extract will actually run the program as if a, a living cell were there. Um, but because it no longer has a cell membrane, it doesn't replicate. So this reaction just basically uh, occurs until it uses up all of the energy equivalents in the reaction, and then it stops. So since there's actually no living cell, there's no uh, risk or danger of having an organism escape because there is no organism anymore. You've just taken kind of uh, uh, some of the parts and put them together and have it work just for a, a small amount of time. And so what we've done in our lab back in 2014 is we found that you can actually take this cell-free extract, that's what it's called. So it's an extract and you can actually freeze dry it. So you can take this extract, you can basically, uh, remove all the water and what's left behind is a powder. So think of, you know, think of a uh, ramen or think of instant coffee, think of like, you know, uh, instant chocolate milk, you know, you, you basically have a powder. And when you add the water back in, the reaction actually does revitalize. Uh, so that was shocking to us. You can take this really complex reaction, turn it into a powder. And when you add water back in, when you rehydrate it, it it reforms, it reconstitutes the functions of that almost living material that you had before. And so it will run these artificial uh, genetic circuits uh, as if it were fresh. Um, and so this uh, freeze dried powder you can store on the shelf for up to a year, we found, and it's still stable and you can rehydrate it whenever you want to have these uh, synthetic circuits uh, executed and run at that time so when you when you freeze dry this reaction is almost as if you're you're pausing the reaction and then you're you're unpausing it when you um, um add it back into the water that's absolutely correct yeah so that that's that's a very apt way of putting it what we've done is we've essentially we found a pause button for biology where you know you can you can press pause and come back to it a year later and then add water and you will press play essentially at that point. Can you explain what specifically your sensor detects and what it tests for in the user? Sure. So our sensor for our face mask uh, contains a, a, a module that can be inserted into the face mask. So it's an add-on. And the sensor in that module will detect um, it senses the genetic material for COVID-19. And so it is actually a nucleic acid test. Um, so I, I'm sure some of your listeners might know this already, that COVID-19 tests, diagnostic tests, comes in two flavors. One is a nucleic acid test, which tests for the genetic material. And the other is a faster antigen test, which tests for proteins that are present um, on the, the COVID-19 uh, virus, right? And so the nucleic acid test, which tests for the genomic material, that's the gold standard because that's what you want, really want to test for. 
to test for the virus. You want to see if that genetic material is there. Um, and that's the most sensitive test that, that, is, that is out there. And so our test is a freeze-dried version of what goes on in the lab. Um, so we, what we've done is we've taken the whole process of what goes on in the lab um, and we, free, we have uh, freeze-dried it so that it works. It's actually embedded in the sensor and it works when you rehydrate it later on. So how exactly does your sensor work and what technology is involved to allow it for, to test for diseases? Um, and also, how did you go about building it? Yeah, so the sensor works in this way. So uh, imagine you have a, a, a patient or a, a user that wants to know whether or not they're COVID-19 positive. And so you would wear this mask. And so the mask, just like any other mask is supposed to do, it captures your breathing particles. So uh, COVID-19, as we know this now, is transmitted through breath aerosols. Every time you breathe, every time you talk, every time you, you uh, yell, sing, anything, um, you're generating a huge amount of aerosols from your lungs. And those aerosols are laden with the COVID-19 virus. And that's how it goes from one person to the next. And so the mask actually prevents that transmission, right? And so your breath actually accumulates on the inside surface of the mask. Um, that's its function. What we've done is we have put a, a, a sensor pad um, right in front of your mouth. And that pad will sit there and it'll collect all of this, uh, all of this virus that is being uh, exhaled from a patient. All right. And so that's the first part. The first part is you have a, a pad right in front of the patient collecting the virus. Um, and after a certain amount of time, we found that uh, 15 to 20 minutes is the approximate amount of time you need, minimum amount of time you need to actually accumulate enough virus for detection. But the longer you wear the mask, obviously the more virus will be accumulated and you'll have a, a better test. Um, so after a certain amount of time, you would press a button on the outside of the mask. And all this button does is it punctures a blister pack that we have included with the module. And that blister pack just contains water. So we've taken the water that you would normally add to a, to a freeze dried reaction and we've packaged it into the mask. And it's a, a little sachet, a little blister that is sealed up. And when you press the button, it punctures that seal and the water flows into the sample pad. So it flows through the sample pad and, and collects all of the, the virus particles that you've breathed into it. And then it moves into what we call micro pads. Um, and so this micro pad region, it, it, micro pad is an acronym. It, sounds, it stands for uh, microfluidic uh, paper-based analytical device. And so it's a device made of paper um, where we have put chemical or biochemical, in this case, synthetic biology reactions into the paper and then you fold it like an accordion so that as the water goes through each layer it basically hits one reaction after another and so it allows you to layer uh multiple reactions uh in an arrangement so that you can have one reaction after another and that's what contains all of our freeze-dried reactions that we've developed um, so we have reactions that lice the virus is open. After that, we have a reaction that takes the, the viral RNA because the COVID-19 has an RNA genome, takes that and converts it to DNA and amplifies up that DNA. And the very last step is something that uses an enzyme called CRISPR to detect that amplified DNA and give us an output. And at the very end, the water makes its way through all of those reactions and then flows into what's called a lateral flow assay. So it's an output strip, very similar to what people would find on a pregnancy test. You either have one band or two bands appearing uh, to give you the, the output of your test. Um, and then that's the, the final result. The whole thing from pressing the button to getting a result takes anywhere from one hour to an hour and a half, um, which is you know pretty quick because right now, uh, in a lot of places, we're, we're talking about a wait time of two to three days just to get your uh, diagnostic test back for COVID-19. 
Um, and so another part of your question is how did we go about building it? Um, well, we, we kind of built it uh, just like we do any other engineering project in our lab. We, we kind of built it kind of working backwards uh, in a piecemeal way. We, we kind of already knew from our research generally how we wanted to build this but we had never put this into a face mask before so that was kind of the big issue is how do we get this into a form factor where it's collecting uh virus particles from the breath and and this whole thing is integrated into a face mask right and so there are parts that we had never really tackled before such as breath uh accumulation in a sensor pad or integrating all of these different parts and so what we did is we focused on that initially. We kind of uh, built it piece by piece and tested each single piece to make sure that piece worked and then stitched it together and then started testing and retesting and troubleshooting to, to make sure that every all of the pieces work together. Um, and so in, in our approach, it's very much like how you would troubleshoot anything else, um, like how you would build a, an engine really. Um, and so, Luckily, we were able to troubleshoot and engineer everything uh, in a short amount of time, which in science terms is about uh, six months. And so that's how long it took us to go from concept to execution and to getting the data that proves that this actually works. So how big was your team, um, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so this... This project was a, a, a three-year project uh, where it, go, it went beyond the face mask. So the the wearables uh, kind of into the part of the project where we are integrating freeze-dried synthetic biology reactions into wearables. That one was you know three years leading us into COVID nineteen, uh, the pandemic, um, which is when we actually did the um, the face mask. So the face mask was kind of an add on. And so there were over a dozen people involved in this whole broader synthetic biology paper um, at different points throughout the the uh, the three years people worked on it. Um, and the COVID-19 mask, since it was a bit limited, uh, we were at that time, uh, the, the, the institute uh, was actually uh, shuttered at that point. And so we had to get special access to access the lab during that time to work on these projects. And so it was limited and we had roughly about three people uh, working on this project actively for the COVID-19 mask. And so uh, that was quite an experience of working during a pandemic on this kind of technology. Um, yeah, so this technology was a, a joint collaboration between the Institute I'm at, which is the Wies Institute, Harvard University and MIT um, as part of uh, Jim Collins's laboratory. He's a synthetic biologist professor at MIT, and all of this was done uh, in his lab. In your study, I read that um, the mask has the potential to detect uh, diseases other than COVID-19. Um, is the procedure for detecting new diseases um, different? Does it require different reactions or is it relatively similar? Yeah, so it is relatively similar. Um, so the face mask uh, can be used for any respiratory virus that is transmitted through aerosols. So anything where you have um, the, the face mask can be used for anything that is respiratory. But the the wearable uh, technology where you we can actually put this on a jacket or we can put this on some something that you wear where it's exposed to a splash. That is different. That you can use to detect things such as Ebola, such as um, uh, antibiotic resistant bugs that are spreading around in hospitals, for example. And so that is a, a different animal than the actual face mask where you can detect things such as the flu or other colds or tuberculosis, for example. Um, and for all of these uh, sensors, for all of these sensors that are in the face mask, or in the ones where you're wearing it and you're detecting some kind of exposure splash event, um, the, the process for changing the sensor so that you can t detect the new disease is actually pretty easy. We only need to re replace a few parts that tell 
the sensor, this is what I want you to detect. So uh, for example, for our, for our face mask, uh, right now the sensor tells um, the, the module, I want you to detect this part of the COVID-19 virus. So it will search for that part of the COVID-19 virus. And if it detects it, it'll give us an output. And in that case, what we do is we just switch out one part. It's a, a part called a gRNA. That's the programmable part that tells the CRISPR enzyme, this is what I want you to find. Uh, we switch it out for a different gRNA. And now that we, we tell the sensor, I want you to look for a tuberculosis gene to tell me that, hey, this patient might have tuberculosis. And it's a very simple switch. We basically order it, we test it, um, and we can probably have a, um, a reworked sensor for a new disease in a few weeks time. So it's, it's very modular in that way. So what sorts of applications do you see for your sensor? Um, and other than face masks, um, what kind of wearables can you implant the sensor? And yeah, so um, we're thinking this can be integrated into any clothing uh, that y one would normally wear uh, or uh, any article of clothing even. And the idea is, uh, for example, we could put this into a laboratory coat for doctors uh, or a, a clinician's coat, a doctor's coat uh, for doctors that work in areas that are known to have um, uh, breakouts of antibiotic resistance genes. So these are uh, infections that you would normally get in a clinic, for example, that where there is no antibiotic for them. So if you if you if you get these infections in a clinic, there's actually no ther therapeutic uh, avenue to prevent uh, this disease from spreading and and, and killing people. Um, and so it's really important to prevent these from uh, actually being transmitted in a clinical setting. And so you could have a, a laboratory coat or a, a doctor's coat where we have this wearable technology on it and it will alert the doctor, hey, you know, you were exposed to an antibiotic resistance bug in this particular part of the hospital. And it would basically be not only a personal protection uh, diagnostic tool, but also be a surveillance tool to uh, alert everyone in the hospital that there's something going on, there's an infection in this part of the hospital that's spreading. Um, and so that way it allows you to kind of figure out what's going on and clamp down on, um, on the spread of this particular potentially infectious disease. And it does so without kind of impeding uh, what the operator is doing. So if the operator is a doctor, the doctor doesn't have to actively continually test themselves. All of this works in the background. Um, and this, the, the system that we developed for clothing actually has a fiber optics system that's integrated into an electronic module. And that module will, uh, it, it's Wi-Fi enabled and it can ping your phone and let you know where you are exposed and at what time and where in the hospital you were at at that point as well. Um, and so it, it's, it's very versatile, very flexible. Um, and so that is one of the first applications that, that we are seeing our wearable technology being applied to is certain case scenarios where you want to, to, to be aware of what you're being exposed to. Yeah. How can one go about just procuring the chip? And do you have an idea of like how expensive it will be? Um, yeah. So right now, um, if we, for example, focus on the face mask, uh, there's been, we've gotten a huge amount of interest in the face mask, obviously, because the world is still knee deep in this pandemic. And uh, we are still seeing, you know, even though we have vaccines, testing is still an essential component to, to kind of uh, mitigate spread. Um, and so we've had a lot of interest in, in developing this. And so right now, all of this technology is still obviously their academic prototypes right now. We have demonstrated that they work in the lab, um, but um, there are a number of hurdles. For example, a lot of what we've done, uh, all of these devices are handmade um, because it's in a lab. And so it's 
it hasn't been adapted for mass manufacturing. And so that is one of the next steps that we have to do. In addition, this mass manufactured product that now has to go through clinical trials with real people to actually go through the regulatory process of getting approval. And then you would have scale up and uh, it would enter the market at that point. And so this whole process, we're kind of working with companies to see if uh, and there have been a lot of companies that have come to us interested in licensing this technology and working with us to go through this entire process. Um, but unfortunately, it does take time. Uh, we want to be careful. We want to make sure that everything is done properly. And so that entire process will take at least at least a year. Um, so we will not be seeing this at your local CVS, uh, you know, tomorrow or anything like that. But um, we are hoping, you know, we, we as we develop this further with companies, um, and it does get commercialized. We, we're hoping that we do see this this technology um, in the wider market, so that you would sometime in the future see a face mask diagnostic for, for example, the flu that can be easily bought uh, either online or at a, a local pharmacy. Uh, and so that's the long term goal that we have. So it, it's it, it's almost like a more convenient testing mechanism for the. For, for the user of the face mask, kind of, rather than going to a clinic or something like that. Yeah, so uh, we do see both applications. You know, you can see this in the clinic. Um, so a lot of clinics right now, uh, you know, worldwide, they're, they're having testing issues where somebody is, is um, not being admitted into the right hospital ward because they don't have a positive test yet, and they're waiting on that positive test. Um, and so ed- every minute really counts, right? Um, so waiting days to get triaged in a hospital, just waiting for a test is, is, is something that we want to, to rectify and to have a result, you know, within an hour, an hour and a half that we think will really make a huge impact. Um, and you know, one other thing that you mentioned was the cost. Um, so the, you know, people have heard about our technology and they always assume that it costs a lot because it's something that has never existed before. Um, but surprisingly it, it, it's, it's very affordable. So one face, one sensor that will be inserted into a face mask that gives you that COVID-19 sensing ability that, that one sensor will cost about $5, uh, right now in our prototype. So $5 that's, you know, that is the cost of a Starbucks latte and you will get a diagnostic test, uh, added onto your mask. Um, And that's a prototype right now. So we are hoping to get that down into the $1 to $2 range. Um, And that's our goal for the cost um, of this test. So how would you go about reducing the price? So the price, so the the prototype that we're we're using right now that we used uh, for our cost analysis, um, a lot of the components are off the shelf components because um, we, we obviously we're just focused on getting this technology out. And so we weren't really focused on reducing costs at that point. Um, And so we just bought whatever we could and put it into our sensor. Um, And you can imagine if instead of buying that, we actually sourced it um, carefully with cost in mind, cost and um, efficiency in mind, uh, we could really drive down the price. And so it's a matter of breaking down all the component parts of the test and seeing how we can reduce the cost, which is an exercise that we have never done before. So you, you mentioned a couple of these things earlier, but other than cutting down the price and also um, also uh, progressing it from a academic prototype, um, how else are you looking to improve this piece of technology and what features are you thinking of adding in the future? Yeah, we're, we are definitely focused also on uh, decreasing the amount of time that the test requires. So right now it's an hour to an hour and a half. It would be great if we can get it to below an hour consistently. And we think as we move from our prototype to our scaled up commercial product, uh, we can actually kind of hit that, that range uh, by optimizing all of the parts of our system. Um, and another area that we would love to improve is sensitivity. Um, so right now, 
our face mask test, uh, our nucleic acid test that works in a face mask is actually as sensitive as a WHO approved test that uh, you would require a laboratory to run. And so a laboratory run diagnostic that takes anywhere from a day to three days to get the result back, we can already achieve um, sensitivity equivalent to that. Uh, what we want to do is we want to beat that sensitivity. We want to make it even more sensitive than the tests that are currently out there. Um, and again, just optimizing our prototype, make, going in and tweaking all the components of our, of our sensor, uh, we think we can actually uh, achieve that, uh, that, that improvement in sensitivity. So those are basically all of the questions that I had. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to talk with me today. I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot. Absolutely. Uh, if you have, if you guys have any other, you know, follow up questions that you want to just mention to your viewers that you might have later on, just email me and then uh, I can just uh, let you know what the answers are.